Hey folks, welcome to class. Well, a special uh, additional class, I suppose I should say. Um, instead of dealing with a lecture today, what I thought I would give you guys is um, an example of an advertisement and uh, show you in general when, how when we talk about analyzing an advertisement, what exactly that means. So I've got here on uh, my screen an advertisement that I think is, is honestly loaded with different techniques that we can discuss. And um, what we're going to do today, at least for a little while, is uh, talk about how these advertisement techniques work and how they make different appeals and why they make the appeals that they do. And hopefully what you can do is, is take what you've learned uh, today and uh, uh, use it as a guide for when you start to analyze your own advertisements. I think today I've asked you guys, starting today I've asked you guys to take a look at some very specific advertising techniques. We're gonna talk about those techniques today and go over uh, examples of what they look like. So let's go ahead and get started. <clears throat> I've got a list here of, uh, of uh, a breakdown that I've done of this particular ad that we're, that we're looking at. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to hide myself so we can see the whole ad, but, uh, but we're going we're gonna, to we're gonna talk about it. So let's see what we've got. First of all, let's identify the medium of this ad. This is obviously a magazine ad. Um, this is the kind where when you open the magazine, um, you'd have the spine of the magazine right down the middle of this ad. So this, this ad clearly takes up a, what's called a full spread of a magazine. Um, you open it up and you see this large ad. <clears throat> so this is an ad for um, foundation, right, for, for a type of makeup. Um, and uh, it's specifically, if you hear, by the way, if you hear some noises in the background, my cat is trying to climb through the window sill. So, uh, so we're going to let her do her thing. So if you hear any rumblings or anything like that, it's just my cat being a jerk. Um, anyway, let's, let's continue. Um, so we've got this, this ad uh, for foundation. It's made by L'Oreal. Um, uh, a common popular uh, makeup company. Um, anyway, so uh, there's a number of techniques that are being used here to to sell us this product. Um, one of the mistakes that a lot of students make when they talk about advertising techniques is the, the furthest they get in their head is that advertisements are designed to uh, uh, to get your attention. But advertisements are designed to do a lot more than just get your attention. They have to hold your attention. They have to tell you things. They have to put an idea about their product in your mind. They have to um, uh, get you to associate maybe a certain lifestyle or a certain benefit with their product. There's a lot more than just getting your attention. So when you are writing an analysis of an advertisement, if you're just talking about how this thing gets your attention and, and, and this other uh, element of this ad get, really gets your attention, eh, you're just, you're just rambling, but you're not saying anything. An advertisement does a lot more than just that, just like a road sign is designed to do more than just get your attention, right? So what we're gonna talk about is not just how this ad gets your attention, it is designed to do that. And you know it's designed to do that because think about the, the medium that we're in. We're, in uh, we're reading a magazine, right? You may be at a bookstore or your uh, phone's Wi-Fi or something isn't, isn't uh, working. You're not getting a signal at the dentist or something like that. And you've got, a, you've got to resort to looking at a magazine. And when people flip through magazines, they don't sit there and read every page from the first word to the last word. This isn't a novel, right? What they do is they uh, flip through until they find things that are interesting. I'll, I'll show myself again while I'm talking. They'll flip through while, uh, uh, until they find something interesting. They'll read about that. They'll keep flipping through. Maybe uh, an ad will catch their attention or something like that, and they'll look at it for a second or two, and then they'll move on. Or maybe it will uh, uh, intrigue them in some way and invite them to uh, stay longer on the page. So the nature of reading through a magazine uh, is that your audience, 
whoever's reading through that magazine is, is not going to be spending a lot of time on each page. So part of what your advertisement has to do is uh, attract your reader and get them to spend more than just a second on the page. Um, so let's talk about uh, a particular technique that this ad uses for that. I've got a list of di uh, the different techniques this, uh, this ad uses, so we're going to jump around a little bit. But I want to talk about um, scale and focus, and I'll add placement to that too. Um, it's one of those techniques that, um, that I, we've got written down in, our, um, in that worksheet, worksheet, in that handout that I gave you guys um, that shows like 30 different advertising techniques. Um, scale and focus is, is one of those things. And the, the long and short of it is, as I mentioned um, the other day on Monday, uh, one of the ways you can make sure that someone's paying attention to what you are uh, trying to show them is to make sure that the, the most interesting thing you're going to show them is placed on the page in the very first place they're going to look. Well, traditionally, um, in, uh, uh, in America, we read uh, uh, our languages from left to right, top to bottom. So I've got, a, I've got a pointer here that you should be able to see on the screen. Our eyes start up here in this corner and it moves down kind of as a diagonal, right? From the, the top left to the bottom right. Some of the very first things we're gonna see on the page is up here, uh, are up here in the, the top right. So if you're an advertiser and your job is to make someone stop on this page and take a look at it, you're going to put something particularly compelling. And what we have here that's particularly compelling is someone looking directly at you, right? This is a picture of uh, Frida Pinto, who happens to be uh, an actress, movie actress. She was in Slumdog Millionaire and that kind of thing. Um, uh, Indian actress, does a lot of uh, American and British movies. Anyway, in addition, she's uh, beautiful, right? Really not, nothing, nothing wrong with that face. Uh, either airbrushed uh, to perfection or makeup to perfection and lit to perfection. Regardless, this is a makeup ad. So what you're going to see is the closest example to a flawless person that you can see. And if you notice, she's looking right at us. So you're flipping through this magazine and boom, pretty lady looking at me. I guess I'll, I'll look back. So <clears throat> that right there is an example of scale and focus and placement. By putting uh, uh, something in the ad in this top right uh, left-hand corner that is designed to get our attention, someone looking at us, the advertisers, the ones who built this ad, have uh, made it actually quite compelling already. If I'm flipping through and I see pictures of, I don't know, cars or, or, or you know, pets or something like that, and then the very next picture is a giant photograph, right? This uh, uh, Frida's head here is almost as big uh, in, on the magazine as it would be in real life. Looking right at me, uh, that's, that's compelling. So the use of placement on the page um, is one technique that the advertisers have used already to uh, get us to stop and look at this advertisement, which if you're going to, to, to understand the message that the advertiser wants you to understand, you've got to stop and look at the advertisement first, right? So step one, kind of complete, but there's also other elements having to do with scale and focus and placement um, to pay attention to. Notice, uh, as far as scale goes, as I just said, it's not just a, a, a far away shot of, of Frida. We have a really close up picture of her face right here on the, the, the top right hand side, especially looking right at us. As her eyes travel down and across the page, we hit the actual product that they're trying to sell and there's an enlarged version of it, right? We, we can see it very clearly what kind of product this is, what it looks like. We'll know what it looks like on the shelves too, right? So smart. 
and as we we get to the left hand side or uh, the right hand side of the page we get to little fine print stuff here we get to a little more information about the product the stuff that's not going to ca catch your attention you're only going to read all this small text if you've already decided to stop on the page so they've been real smart about it they've put the most visually compelling stuff in the spots that you're most likely going to to look at at the very beginning when you flip through this page and then they've gone and put the less compelling stuff along on the right hand side and along the edges where you're going to look uh less frequently you'll get to those if 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 uh frida pinto looking you right in the eyes and smiling at you is enough to get you to pause on this page uh, uh they've done their job at least in that in the regard of getting you to pay attention and now they can provide you with a little more specific information so size and scale in this case and position is really designed to first catch our attention second show us what this product looks like and third lead us into the more detailed information that we may not have stopped at in the first place so let's talk about uh, other techniques um, demonstration that's when uh, in an advertisement they show you actually what the product does right in a commercial about a vacuum they show the vacuum vacuuming up things that regular vacuums can't can't vacuum up well those kind of things well in in a still picture it's hard to show a demonstration but we do have some examples if you look here we have a blob of this uh, foundation and it's not just here in the middle of the page behind the behind the actual uh, picture of the uh, the applicator I guess but it goes back into the picture of Frida and it blends into her skin as if it's flawlessly blending uh, uh, matching her skin tone and in fact the name of this product is true match and if you stop and read this it's actually a product for women with darker skin probably women of color right they make up a smaller percentage of women in our country and usually they get marketed to less from makeup because if you have to blend 50 or 100 different colors uh and make all that expense or or, or pay all that expense to match as many women as as possible but then you've got to turn around and do the same thing for women of color who only make up say 30 percent of all the women you could sell your product to you're just uh it's not as good of an investment and so traditionally we see that there's a lot more makeup made for uh white people than for people of color and so this ad is actually an ad for um that that probably uh uh has more value to women of color if I had to guess I don't have to guess I actually know where this ad came from but if I had to guess I would say that you would find this particular magazine ad in ad in a magazine that um uh, uh women of color typically buy maybe something like uh like jet or ebony or or, or whatever right there's also an ad like this with Beyonce on it too by the way um but uh so this is clearly an advertisement aimed at uh people of color women of color and these women traditionally have difficulty more difficulty than white women do finding makeup that matches their skin tone because not as much makeup is made for women of color that's changing but it's still it's still an issue so the main uh uh logical attraction of this particular of this particular product is that it's designed specifically for you you woman of color and look here's a product demonstration it's not real obviously this is just photoshopped in there but look at it blending into her skin tone and in fact it's kind of a demonstration as well if you look over here on the right hand side of the page we have a number of different colors of the product as well right we go from like a peach all the way down to like a, a, a caramel or something like that in color right so even now it's showing us what you know some of the options that are available so we've got 
a couple of different examples of demonstration being used. So to, uh, 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 another advertising technique being used, and honestly, this is probably logos in action, right? This is a, lo a logical appeal. It's showing us literally real world, hopefully, factual evidence of what this product looks like and uh, the fact that it can match your skin, right? So makes a logical appeal. And if you remember our discussion of your upcoming essay assignment, that's exactly the kind of things I'm asking you to do, right? Analyze uh, an advertisement, pick out the different advertising techniques that are being used, explain them, and then show what type of appeal they make to your reader. So here we've got demonstration. I would say that it makes a, a, a logical appeal. It shows you exactly the benefits you can get from this particular product. Let's look at another technique that's used. It's not as scientific as, as some uses of it, but facts and figures. It's another technique. It's when your advertiser uses uh, uh, data, um, real numbers generated from testing, those kind of things to, to prove uh, something about their, their product. And there's a handful of things here. It's not just when you use a number. Numbers don't necessarily mean that it's facts and figures. Um, but they do use a couple of, uh, do provide a couple of examples um, of facts and figures. If you look up here at the top right hand corner, it says meet the number one award winning makeup collection. We actually have number one nationwide here as well. We'll talk about that in a second. With 24 shades in warm, neutral, and cool undertones, you're guaranteed to find the one you've been looking for all along. Okay, so there's 24 shades in this particular product line. The claim here is that we have enough different shades to match anybody, right? So there's a, there's, there are our facts and figures, and they're not just shades. We actually have them with a, a cool and warm and neutral undertones. So if you're kind of olive complexion, we can, we can uh, hit that. If you're more of a, of, a, of a cream, I guess, we can hit that color too, right? So that right there is, uh, are some facts and figures as well. Again, showing you uh, how this product can potentially match what it is you're what, what it is you're looking for, the the legitimate benefits it's providing. So that's a that's a logical appeal as well. And when we get to the number one worldwide thing, when we get to the number one award-winning makeup collection, actually, if you look right there, there's a little asterisk right there. And then you have to go to the bottom of the page to read what that asterisk is. Can you read that? I barely can. I had to zoom in. And when it says number one worldwide, what they mean is, uh, let's see what if I can see what this is. Uh, basically, according to marketing polls that have been done in 29 different countries. All right. Well, that may be impressive. That may not be impressive. I don't know anything about how those polls were conducted, how many people they used, uh, if the data was biased. But if they did in fact conduct these polls and in America, it would be illegal for them to, to say these things without having done that. Then there's some additional support uh, uh, for the fact that there's some some uh, validity, some usefulness to this product. Is it actually number one worldwide? In a very specific, limited uh, definition of number one worldwide, according to that asterisk, yes, I guess it is. But, um, so it's not the best use of facts and figures if you are thinking critically about what that what that text actually means but it's still an example of facts and figures it's just not uh, uh, particularly um, compelling to me but many people as you know will just see that number one worldwide that must mean a lot of people use it uh, and get good results I'll use it too and that's all they need right 
no one stops and looks at or very few people stop and look at that asterisk and go wait a minute this is their own studies that they conducted of course their makeup's gonna gonna perform in their own studies I'm sure they set them up so that it would anyway I'm not here to, to I'm not trying to dog on this particular uh, advertisement it's just a reminder that um, that even though these techniques are being used their degree of credibility um, can range widely. So what else do we have? Um, let's look here in the middle. Latent, the tent, the the tenting, I guess. True Match, well, cause it's L'Oreal, it's a French company, right? True Match, huh? That's an interesting uh, uh, term to use for uh, a product name to use. For a product that's designed to match your skin tone, right? Not perfect match, right? Not um, uh, anything else, but true match. And in fact, when you stop and think about true match, it almost uh, uh, makes you think about like a, a, a relationship, right? And that's not just me um, making stuff up. If you uh, read through the text, there's a lot of implications that that using true match is a lot like finding uh your 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 perfect love um first of all let's let's look over here no more searching no more guessing trust true match to match your skin's unique tone texture and clarity like no other for a flawless look every time all right all right your gear and up here you're guaranteed to find the one you've been looking for all along does that sound like makeup or does that sound like we are um, uh, on snapchat it sounds more like we're, we're looking for a lover right so these words are what we might call loaded words right uh, that's another one of our techniques where we use words that have either multiple meanings or a great depth of meaning to not just put a factual idea into your head but also to to create thoughts uh, uh, that don't necessarily have to do with the product but make you associate them with that product so finding the one you've been looking for all along a lot of words with perfect complexion complete harmony perfect unity true match you found your match so it's pretty clear that uh, they're using some loaded words the words that they're using are designed to make it seem like finding uh, or using this makeup is going to make you as happy as as uh, uh, finding your ideal boyfriend or girlfriend and that's not a that's not I don't think that's me reading into it they chose these words very specifically right they have committees that sit around and, and try to name these products something that will be compelling and they chose true match because that's kind of a phrase that we use when we're talking about people not really about makeup so loaded words those are designed to in this case instill uh, emotion into us right we're the reader we're supposed to see this particular product as um, uh, a favorite person in our lives right something that we truly deserve or something like that there are other loaded words too I mentioned them finally complete harmony with skin texture perfect unity with skin tone harmony unity did I, am I buying makeup or am I at like a, a massage parlor are you gonna give me like a hot stone massage and uh, uh, teach me to breathe correctly right so pretty pretty uh, elevated language use here for for makeup right we're, we're really we're really uh, landed on thick well that's the point right instead it is just makeup in the real world you're basically smearing dirt and oil on your face right fill in those pores and give yourself kind of a, 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 a porcelain doll complexion to your face and that's not very interesting so instead what they do oh they start talking about making you meeting your true matches and finding complete harmony and perfect unity 
So those, th those two are examples of loaded words. And even if you look at the bottle down here, you probably can't uh, read it very well, but it says um, super, blend bl uh, super blendable perfecting foundation. Well, yeah, that's what foundation is supposed to do. But perfecting, do you really need perfecting in there? If it just said foundation, that's fine, I guess. But when's the, when's the last time that you've ever bought ketchup as opposed to fancy ketchup? Advertisers add uh, uh, words like premium and, and special and, uh, uh, and stuff like that. In this case, um, uh, perfecting. And by themselves, they don't mean anything. There's no real claim that's being made. But they, but they add it to this product's description or its name to make you think that uh, it has some power that it doesn't. I guarantee you, you've never bought ketchup in your life. You've only bought fancy ketchup. I guarantee you that you've never bought bacon in your life. You've only bought premium bacon. And that's how they roll. So there are more loaded words. They don't mean anything. They're just designed to get you to ascribe a particular feeling or emotion or quality to this product. There's nothing logical about that. It's all emotion. It's all getting you to think I'm perfect or I can be perfect if I wear this, uh, put this product on, right? And we even have a, technically another technique, a glittering generality. It's when you get a phrase, typically, that, that, that sounds really good, but it doesn't mean anything. A perfect complexion is born. I know what you mean by that. What you mean is that if I, if I use this product, my, I will have a perfect complexion. But they can't say that legally, because obviously it's not true for everybody. So instead, what they do is they say something meaningless. A perfect complexion is born, playing off of the whole a star is born phrasing. So it's designed to give us a couple of different uh, feelings. One, oh look, that's like a star is born. I'll be a star if I wear this. But also, a perfect complexion is born. It's not something you have to work for. You just put this on and, and, and you, are, you are transformed. You are birthed into a perfect complexion. Can a, can a complexion be born? No, a complexion is just what you look like. You don't birth a complexion any more than you than destiny can have a child. That's something that 14-year-olds write in their uh, uh, diary about, you know, the name of their band when they grow up. And that's literally where Destiny's Child name Destiny's Child's name came from and it sounds like it cuz it's a meaningless term. Same thing here. This glittering generality is designed to get you to feel like uh, you're going to be someone special. You're going to have this perfect complexion if you wear this. But nowhere here have they made that claim. Now, again, I'm not hating on this uh, this ad. It's actually uh, the reason I'm using it is that it's a ridiculously um, uh, effective ad as far as the techniques it uses. Um, but I'm just reminding you that by being uh, a critical reader, a critical thinker, we can see these ads for what they are. They are building a, uh, a fantasy where in reality you just pick this thing up at Walmart or, or, or I don't know, uh, uh, Ulta or something like that, smear it on your face, and hopefully your face is the same color as your neck by the time you get done with it. I know how it works. Anyway. So glittering generality, loaded words. In this particular example, those are designed uh, to create an emotional response in, in the reader, right? Pathos. Well, I've said true match about a billion times and so has this advertisement. There's a use of repetition here in this ad and they repeat the words true match or match at least five different times. Well, why would you want to do that? Why do I need to repeat the name of this product? If they just, if they don't know what it is, they can just read it again, right? Eh, remember, this is a magazine ad. And so uh, they're expecting you to kind of go through it really quickly. And even if you do stop on it, there's no guarantee you're going to back up and read 
something you've already read in this magazine. So what they do is by repeating true match multiple times, there's five repetitions of it in here, they kind of beat it into your head so that when you go to uh, Ulta or whatever, you're like, what was the name of that thing? Oh yeah, true match, because it's like finding my, my true love. That's how I remembered it. By, by repeating that product name, they, they build it into your head and you're more likely to not only remember it, but also to think fondly of it. That's why, as I mentioned the other day, uh, uh, political campaigns are oftentimes measured in how much money they have to spend. Because the more money you have to spend, the more advertisements you can put out, the more advertisements you put out, the more time you mention your name to, to, to your constituents. And if your constituents don't know anything about you or they don't care that much, what they've, what they've found is that, that without a particular preference, people will select the thing that they are most familiar with, even if it's not something that they should be selecting. If they've just heard the name enough times, they'll choose that over other names, all things being being equal. So what we have here is a number of repetitions of the term true match. Here's a, a quote ostensibly from Frida. There's only one true match for me. Again, she doesn't even sound like she's talking about makeup, right? So we'll move on. We'll, we'll come back and talk about this particular uh, 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 testimonial in a second. One true match for me. Well, there's one example of true match. Frida Pinto's true match uh, is W6 Golden Honey. Okay. There's another mention of true match, and it's also um, an example of, uh, I wouldn't necessarily call this facts and figures, but it is actually um, saying that it's, this is a real product being used on uh, uh, this particular person right now. So it's at least making the claim that she's wearing it, probably. Anyway, up here, top of the page, almost right in the middle, right as your eye comes across, true match largest it's going to be on the page right here so there's a third example of a repetition fourth we have it on the product itself and then over here trust true match once again to match your skin's unique tone so we see we see five different examples and if you notice there's only like i don't know four or five sentences on this entire advertisement. So pretty much every one of them that isn't a glittering generality mentions true match. And again, that's not a mistake or um, a, a redundancy. It's done purposefully. The more times they, they repeat this stuff, the more likely you are to remember it. And sometimes, uh, an advertisement isn't just trying to make an appeal to you. It's trying to get you to, it is trying to get you to pay attention. It is trying to get you to remember their product. And this is an example of that. Just like the placement on the page of these images is designed to get you to stop and read and pay attention. The repetition of true match is designed to get you to remember. So not so much an appeal as it is recognizing the benefits and limitations of the media that you're advertising in and using all of its strengths that you can to uh, uh, make sure you get your message across and that it's, that it's remembered. Okay, so we've talked about scale and focus and, and placement, repetition, loaded words, glittering generalities, facts and figures, uh, we've even seen some demonstrations here. Um, let's look at star power. It's not a coincidence that they chose a ridiculously beautiful woman who also happens to be famous uh, and made her uh, the central focus of this ad, right? Uh, Frida Pinto um, is relatively famous. If you didn't know who she is, her name's right down here. Just to remind you that this isn't some model, this is someone that you should know, apparently. But if you do know anything about her, like I said, she's a, a, a relatively famous um, 
Indian actress, does a lot of British and American films, was in Slumdog Millionaire is the, the most uh, popular one I think that she was, she was in. And so when you see her, not only her looking at you is more likely to get you to, to stop and focus, but we have her, ostensibly at least, wearing this makeup, right? This is a celebrity endorsement. So using star power, using that celebrity endorsement is another technique being used. Look, this famous person uh, wears this particular makeup. If it's good enough for her, maybe it's good enough for you. And arguably, uh, part of this advertising technique has to, has to do with an appeal to authority, right? Either the real appeal to authority or the uh, logical fallacy one. If it's a solid appeal to authority, it will be, uh, Frida here will be someone who knows a lot about makeup. Eh, I don't know. I mean, I understand that she's a woman, right? And that uh, traditionally uh, women are uh, the ones that, that wear makeup in our, in our society for the most part. That's changing, but I'm just drawing, very, painting with very broad strokes here. And so we get the idea that Frida, as a woman, would certainly uh, know something about makeup. But also she's, you know, in the movies. And so maybe, you know, I, I don't know. I don't know if that's the best argument, though. You think she puts on her own makeup when she goes on set? Absolutely not. They have uh, uh, makeup folks to get you ready for, for the set, right? So... Star power, definitely. This is definitely a, a, a testimonial from an authority figure. But is she truly an authority on makeup? Eh, probably not. So this, this borders on a logical fallacy of appeal to authority. It's not the, the true appeal to authority, like when you ask a doctor uh, something medical. But I don't know, maybe Frida does have, you know, maybe, maybe she's got her cosmetology license or something like that. But that's not really the point. The point isn't whether or not the appeal is, is real or not. The, the, the point is whether or not it's effective. And here you have a beautiful woman telling you, who's, who's a, a movie star, telling you essentially that she uses this makeup. And for most people, that's, that's good enough, right? Popularity equals... Uh, uh, authority to a lot of people. So for most folks, probably this is an effective appeal, right? That's that, that star power, that celebrity endorsement. So in addition to uh, that technique, there's also a testimonial that she gives. Right. Remember it when what a testimonial is, it's when someone uh, says something positive or says uh, uh, something about the product that they've used. If you go to Yelp and you read a bunch of reviews about a particular restaurant, those are all testimonials. Well, here we've got a quotation marks around this sentence down here at the bottom. There's only one true match from me. Now, it doesn't say that Frida said this line directly. It only implies it, correct? It's got quotation marks. And there's the picture of her face, but nowhere does it actually for, uh, make the claim that she's said those words. Chances are, though, they just had her read these words. It doesn't matter if she meant them or not. But assuming that she is uh, uh, serious about, the, about what she's saying, and it's, it's really strange, actually, that she decided to use the same true match words as the name of the product, right? So almost certainly uh, that's not a coincidence. Almost certainly they're like, uh, Frida, could you read this line so that we can legally put it in this magazine ad for you? Sure, I'll do that. Keep slapping me with a lot of bills. There's only one true match for me. That's technically a testimonial that at least implies that she uses this makeup and that she's happy with it. So that adds to the, the star power technique being used. It's not just her face, it's her face and her telling you, the reader, uh, essentially, I use this product and uh, I approve of it, right? So it doesn't really matter if those things are true or not, those still appeal 
to our audience. Theoretically, they would appeal logically. If uh, Frida has a lot of experience with makeup and uh, uh, she is a woman of color, that is the, the goal of what this product is, is trying to, to get across to us. It's, it's, it's great for women with darker uh, skin tones then her words have some real value. Even if she doesn't have anything uh, or know anything about makeup or whatever, and uh, uh, have, maybe she doesn't have a lot of experience even uh, having trouble matching her skin tone, I don't, I don't know. But the very fact that she makes these claims is still an appeal to the audience, if nothing else. They appeal, they, they provide the, the argument that this makeup works for me, I'm a woman of color, and, and, and we are from that uh, uh, example to assume that maybe this makeup will work for me as well, another person of color or something like that. So we've got a testimonial as well. So. There's one more thing that I've noticed, and, and so I, we've got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine different techniques used and multiple versions of these techniques used in some places. The last technique I want to mention is a, a call to action. And in a call to action, that's when your writer, your, your media creator says, hey, you know what? You should do something. Now that you know uh, about this particular issue, you should do something about it. A lot of times um, when you guys write essays, especially in high school, they would tell you, you know what, at the end in your conclusion, maybe call your reader to action. Say, look, now that you know about this problem that I mentioned on campus in my essay about how there's not enough lighting or something like that and it's dangerous to take night, night classes, maybe uh, you could help out and be, the, be part of the solution. Write, your uh, write the chancellor and say that you know you think that uh, more lights should be added across campus to Im improve safety. That's calling your reader to action. So we actually see a call to action technique used as well over here in the, the right text. And you know it's a call to action when the text tells you to do something specifically. Nike, just do it. You're telling me to do something, right? Uh, I'm not sure what it is. Apparently, it's just whatever I think it is. But they, whatever it is, they want me to just do it, right? Or um, I'm trying to think of an, any other examples that just immediately uh, uh, pop into my head. I don't know. Anyway, we've got it. We've got a good example here, so let's use it. Here's what we got. No more searching, no more guessing. Trust True Match to match your skin's unique tone. Okay, well, there you go. It's calling you to action. It's saying, hey, you should try this yourself. You should trust True Match. Trust is already a, a, an interesting word to use instead of uh, something like try True Match and, and see for yourself or something like that. Trust, there's another kind of a loaded word there. Right, lots of words that we would use for a significant significant other that we are close to. But anyway, trust True Match to match your skin's unique tone. That right there is a call to action. It's challenging you, the reader, to do something with this. And that works on a lot of people, right? It encourages them to, to go out and, and do this thing, whatever it is, right? Uh, grab life by the horns right isn't that the the ram truck commercial uh, uh slogan or whatever meaning that if you do if you do buy a ram truck you are the kind of person who grabs life by the horns you are someone to be taken seriously similarly here if you buy true match right you're someone who trusts this product to uh, uh, uh give you a, a, a skin tone that matches the rest of your, your body, something that's a little bit more uh, difficult as a woman of color or a person of color. And also, you know, you're, 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 you're in good company. Frida Pinto uses this, and maybe she's telling you to trust True Match too. Well, Frida looks pretty good, so I'll, I'll trust this product as well. 
So right there, those are nine different advertising techniques and they run the gamut of uh, what their what their goals are. Some are designed, a handful of them are designed to, to get your attention. Some are designed to get you to remember this product or know what it looks like. Some are designed to uh, uh, play on your emotions and make you think that you're going to get some sort of uh, 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 boyfriend, girlfriend, loving match uh, uh, response outcome from using this product. You're still just smearing stuff on your face, right? But the way they've described it, uh, it's going to be like finding your one true love. Man, that's going to be some good makeup, right? What's it got meth in there? Anyway, uh, and then yet others are designed to appeal to us intellectually, hopefully, right? It's the number one product, according to us. There's 24 uh, different skin tones, not a whole lot, but still, that's a lot more than zero. And this celebrity uh, seems to use it and seems to swear by it. So we've made some uh, 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 authoritative appeals as well, right? So this ad has uh, logos, it's got some pathos, it's got a little bit of ethos, whether or not it's, it's a logical fallacy or not, that ethos is questionable, but it doesn't matter if it's effective. Solid ad. I've talked about this ad for like 45 minutes now. That's easily four pages of text, right? So this is the kind, this is an example of the kind of work uh, that goes into analyzing an ad for say our essay for, for this unit. Um, obviously, I don't, I don't think no one is expected to, to look at ads in this way for this amount of time every time you see one, though it is kind of fun to do if, if you're me, maybe not if you're anybody else, but if you're me, right? Don't do it while you're driving down the highway. You know, that road sign is really a good example of pay the, right, you don't want that. So uh, what this is supposed to be, what today's lecture is supposed to be is just an example of uh, how to break down these ads, identify the different techniques that are being used, and then explain how those techniques make particular types of appeals or otherwise uh, make the reader more likely to accept uh, or remember the message being being uh, brought across to us. So um, hopefully this has been helpful. It's one thing to, to see that list of, uh, of advertising techniques and, and, and do some homework assignments on it. It's another thing entirely to actually go through an example together and uh, uh, see how it actually plays out in the real world, I think. So hopefully this has been helpful for you guys. We're gonna wrap things up. Now I'm gonna go ahead and, and put this on canvas for you guys. But um, uh, I'm gonna leave the discussion uh, open uh, below um, the entry here. If you have any uh, additional things to say about this ad, or even if you just wanna let me know if this particular uh, 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 class has been helpful, I would appreciate it. Um, just because I want to, you know, I'm, I'm trying to get across uh, some, some pretty technical things in this unit. And uh, uh, I want to make sure we're all on the same page, that we're not just all kind of making up stuff off of our, out of our heads and, and assuming uh, or, or, or trying to convince ourselves that there's some techniques in an ad when maybe there's not. I want us to see that this is stuff that real advertisements do. Uh, companies spend millions, maybe billions of dollars every year on crafting these messages. And even something as simple as a, a humble magazine ad has dozens of examples of advertising techniques used to influence its readers. So anyway, hopefully that's, uh, that's been helpful. We're done for today. Hope this has been uh, useful for you guys. Uh, good luck and uh, I'll talk to you soon.